shooting fashion. In between costume changes were after pheasants with Crow and Childerly. Continuing with that theme, Edward King is back and he explains appropriate game day attire. You don't have to go to the extremes of colour coordinating your own shooting suit with the colour of your dog. Plus, Tim Pillbeam is straight talking. Some people like a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> He's testing straight pull rifles, a blazer, a Merkel and a Browning. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Never has the term fashion shoot been more fitting. Instead of the usual sporting catalogues filled with models looking gorgeous pretending to be proficient shots, here we have our proficient shot being a model. And what a fine specimen he is. Yeah, I'm feeling handsome. Part of the deal today is that in between drives, Pro has to strip off and don some of Jack Pike's extensive new shooting and lifestyle range. But in order to hinder his shooting, they're messing around in the wardrobe department. They've given me a shirt, a small shirt, I can hardly move it. But I think that was done intentionally. Yeah, we're doing the new, the new catalogue. We're just doing some of the game stuff today, shirts, ties, gilets, uh, new socks. It's just all about game shooting today. The Chinese water deer in front, though. The visibility's not brilliant today. How will that affect things today? Uh, it's not too bad. I've shot him worse. Um, they just fly a little bit blind from the start, but be interested to see how it goes. The fact is, they shot the catalogue last week with me, but just for fun, they've brought along Dax the photographer. He looks the part, but with not a single memory card in sight, he's firing blanks, which can't be said of Crow. Some chap called Paul Childerly is hosting the day on his ground in Bedfordshire. A couple of the drives will offer pheasant, partridge and duck, so Andy has a selection of game ball, steel and lead. Paul's informed me that um, this is a mixed drive. It's a mixture of uh, pheasants and duck, so to cover myself, I'm going to be using game ball super steel. They're in fives, 32 grams. I've used them before on the pigeons, shot them really well. I used them on ducks many a time, so I've got loads of faith in them. Uh, they're a faster cartridge, so, but I'm pretty sure I'll pretty soon find the line of them, so I'll pretty soon get over that. This particular drive is a stonker. The circling ducks overhead mean you're spinning every which way instead of looking straight ahead. As Crow has eyes in the back of his head thanks to all that pigeon shooting, it means little escapes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual drive because it's a small pond at the back and there's another pond down the uh, far end of the uh, field. And the ducks come off there really well actually, they're circling everywhere, go back over top the tall pines behind. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good drive, especially in this weather. Weather's thick fog, um, not the best for shooting, but I think they're flying well. Uh, Mr Crow seems to be performing. In between his clothes changes and his uh, makeup, he's doing well. <laughs> There you go, mate. Thank you. No worries. Once we've got the, the line of the cartridge, the cartridges are a bit different, so once we've got the line of the cartridge, you know, I'll do all right then. But yeah. But no, that was a good drive. Good drive. How many shots do you reckon you had? Uh, I don't know, I must have had 45. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, about 45 shots there, so. But missed a few for a start, but once, like I say, once I got the line of the cartridge, well, the feel of the cartridge, I was doing all right then. Mr Childerly is having a good season, but has played with his pheasant varieties this year. Um, we trained, changed the stock of the pheasants this year to um, Kansas. Um, and yeah, it's, it's made, a, made, made a world of difference. They're flying really well. Um, the partridge at Becker and Joe's fly well anyway, but the pheasants just, just it's made a difference to the shoot really. 
How do you make that decision? How do you think, right, yeah, I'm going to go for Kansas this year? Um, <sighs> good question, really. It, it's, it's a brave decision because the, the Americans are renowned for wandering. Um, so, you know, it, it, it puts your percentage of, of returns down, but, you know, you get better flying birds, so actually you shoot more birds, a better quality. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a gamble. It's all gamble, really. Um, yeah, also, how many choices have you really got? How many sort of options did you think you have out seriously um, for this this type of ground? For this ground, I mean, we tried several different types. Um, I'm not going to name any because people get a bit touchy about different birds fly better than this, that, and the other. Um, the old days, we used to have uh, fen crosses, um, and they they flew really well. Uh, and we had Americans like the blue back things a few years ago. They they flew as well, but the returns were very very poor. Um, but so far, so good these, this year with these, these new ones. Are they a bigger bird? No, slightly smaller. Um, very skittish in the pens as well. We, we put them in the release pens and they wanted, wanted to come out straight away. Um, literally, Scott, the keeper, he, he put them in one of the pens and you know, a couple of thousand birds and they were, they were on, the, on the toes like two days later. There's another drive before lunch and there is a bit of bird poaching going on between Andy and the neighbouring gun, Glen. For this shoot, Crow is using the more familiar Beretta 692. It looks smart on a game shoot and the clay ground. After lunch, we have enough light for two more drives. The day should deliver a bag around the 200 mark and the last drive will put a lot of birds over the guns. It's true, the birds are over the guns, but some guns are clearly taking liberties. You need to know your neighbour very well to shoot what is blatantly someone else's bird. But as it's been going on all day, it's a suitable ending to what has been a relaxed and enjoyable shoot with Paul and Jack Pike. It's been good me a lot of grief all day. It's, uh, last, uh, last drive of the day, I thought I'd uh, get my own back. Um, drop several at his feet. I've dropped several the other side of him. But it's all in, all in fun, having a laugh. So, but no, it's, that was a good drive that one for me. Even if it was only just dropping them at his feet. If you want to find out more about Paul stalking and game shooting, go to childerlysporting.co.uk and for more information about the new Jack Pike range, or maybe to order a catalogue with Mr Crow as centre spread, go to jackpike.co.uk. Everyone looking very smart. Now, someone who's also looking smart these days and warm. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Raptors have been having a tough time of it, not from gamekeepers, but from bird watchers. The RSPB is facing embarrassing questions after its Vice President, Professor Sir John Lawton, was charged with recklessly and intentionally disturbing a bird of prey while it was in a nest containing its young. The CPS decided not to press the charge due to the defendant's age. Meanwhile, the forest of Boland in Lancashire's only two peregrine nesting attempts have been destroyed by disturbance, one of them by a bird watcher installing a surveillance camera overlooking the nest. Antis are appalled to hear that deer in parks need to be culled. The City of London Corporation has approved plans for the deer stalking group, the Capriolus Club, to shoot the deer near East London's Epping Forest. As the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust has wearily been pointing out to surprise journalists, it happens everywhere. A gamekeeper falsely convicted and imprisoned for being a drugs baron is to receive substantial damages. William Stirrett was keeper on the Douglas and Angus estate in Lanarkshire, owned by the 15th Earl of Hume, where he taught Prince William and Prince Harry how to shoot. When police found a drugs factory in the woodland there, they wrongly concluded that Stirrett was behind it. The stress destroyed his marriage while his family lost their tied home on the estate where he'd been working. Despite his convictions being quashed, the police refused to give him back his firearm certificate because he had spoken to the newspapers about his story. Mannequin challenges are all the rage and the all-female shooting group Femme Fatale have come up with a good one. They filmed this at Park Lodge Shooting School in East Yorkshire. Fussier viewers can be assured that the video was safety checked by professionals before filming. Pakistan is once again becoming a destination for driven bird shooting. 
After five years of conservation efforts, the majestic shoot held at Kohistan Safaris with APF game birds took place last month. It claims to be the biggest upland shikar in the history of Pakistan and an example of how hunters can be at the forefront of conservation. Thanks to Ali Mufti for this story. Fancy shooting down irritating drones. There is a new drone gun available from the US. The drone gun from Drone Shield jams the signal of incoming drones and brings it down safely. So you can be up one drone on the deal too. Visit DroneShield.com. A British butcher specialising in game meat has reached the 100,000 subscriber mark on YouTube. The Scott Rear project received his YouTube silver button after five years on YouTube. Scott still has his day job as a butcher in a shop in Worcester. And finally, a video of a seven-year-old girl shooting her first deer has gone viral just because of the look on her face. Lily Clapper from Texas has been practicing for this moment since she was five years old. She shoots a white-tailed doe and the film has now been watched one and a half million times. Thanks to all those who sent us a story. Her face is a picture. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, before we get to shoot curious, last week, Edward highlighted the problem of people who turn up to shoots without their guns. He suggested to the more forgetful that they leave their guns by their doors overnight. Some of you were offended by this. There you have it. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Now, fresh from behind the drawbridge of his castle that's guarded by his crocodiles, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't leave his gun by the door, it's Edward King on the subject of shoot fashion. Shoot Curious, a very British game shoot explained. How to dress, what is a beater, what is a sporting bird? If you have been invited and have no clue, then this is for you. No. Nah. Dress. You need to dress accordingly or appropriately for the type of day it's going to be. If you're going on a very smart shoot, then you probably wish to dress slightly more smartly. If it's a, an informal shoot, then rather than wearing a full shooting suit, you might wear a pair of odd breeches and you might wear a gilet or some kind of shooting vest or even sometimes just a jersey if it's not going to be a, a, a nasty pluvious day. There are other bits and pieces that will make your day more enjoyable. A waterproof, just in case it rains. Who knows, in an hour's time, it might be pelting with rain, and what I'm wearing now isn't just going to do the job. So take a waterproof, take a cap. I have seen everything from full Russian chapkas to pink bobble hats studded with diamonds on the shooting field. The latter probably being a more rare occurrence. Wellies. Always take wellies with you. Uh, because you just don't know the land you're going to be walking through. You don't have to go to the extremes of colour coordinating your own shooting suit with the colour of your dog, although I'm sure a lot of hosts appreciate it. But seriously, there is a certain amount of ritual involved with the shooting day, and it's important to make some form of effort. But that doesn't mean that you have to go and have a tailor-made three-piece shooting suit just for one day's shooting. If you're starting out and you're not even sure whether it's going to be for you or not, then there are a number of things that uh, you can do which will make you fit in without any form of embarrassment. Really, I think you probably need a pair of stout shooting socks. And if you don't want to go to the extent of having breeches, then wear some decent outdoor trousers, corduroys perhaps, or thick chinos, and roll your socks up over on top of the trouser so that it looks like you're wearing breeches. A pair of stout shoes will be fine, or a pair of wellies will equally be fine. Uh, and on the top, a decent outdoor jersey uh, or a sweater, some kind of waterproof coat in the sort of uh, 
um, a wax cotton or Tweedy style um, will do you fine. It's important to bear in mind that you don't want to look out of place. Then there is the thorny issue of tie or no tie. Uh, I think the advice probably is uh, if you have a tie and it's suitable, i.e. it's muted colours or it has emblems of birds or other game species on it, then by all means wear one. I'm not saying it just uh, from the point of view of elegance, but actually it does close your shirt and it stops drafts getting in where perhaps you wouldn't want them to. Uh, thereafter, you can go in for colour coordination, you can go in for a tweed suit, you can even have a cap, you can have a cape. There are a plethora of things you do and uh, those really are for the people who do slightly more shooting and enjoy it and actually um, probably the, the more ebullient uh, members of the, the shooting fraternity. Fashion faux pas are fortunately rare in the shooting field, uh, but I have found myself getting off an aeroplane in a distant land and my suitcase ending up in a different land uh, and having to do the first drive, which happened to be a duck drive, so in a marsh wearing a three-piece pinstripe suit and black shoes. Um, much mirth on behalf of the fellow guns, uh, but a hefty dry cleaning bill and a new pair of shoes at the end of the day for me. Uh, so do try and dress in a way which will make you uh, feel comfortable and actually achieve the aim of the exercise, which is to be uh, warm and dry uh, from beginning to end of day. No. Thank you, Edward. Now, Tim Pilbeam is not only a Field Sports Channel mega star, similar to Mick Jagger, he's also a rifle reviewer for many magazines, and he's been invited down to the range to look at three different rifles with a similar theme. They're straight pulls. Straight pull rifles, what are they all about? They're more complicated than the normal turn bolt, but people still like them. And they're a lot more expensive. So what is it about the straight pull that people really, really like? This is the Merkel Helix, and the straight pull is in the name. It's straight, it goes backwards and forwards, it's linear, so therefore you're only moving backwards and forwards. A standard traditional turn bolt, there's actually four movements. You're pushing forward, then we're going down to lock the, the round in the chamber, then we've got to go back up again and back. So there's four movements, forward, down, up, and back. And that twisting, is what causes the rifle to be slightly unsettled. Whereas a straight pull, there's none of that whatsoever. The other thing is, it's all about this sight picture. It's if I can see his beast, uh, and with a turn bolt, I'm twisting. And it, so I'm not really maintaining my, what we call sight picture. I'm not, it's actually not easy to actually hold on to that same position. Whereas the straight pull, I'm literally, I'm actually always looking at that target. On the slow motion, shooting the rifle, it's like really obvious about the morale. You can see that the bolt returns automatically, it's sprung. Quite a clever system here, so you let it go. So you pull it back, still you push it back and forwards, let it go. So this is a very, very fast system. Is it any faster than the Merkel Helix? Because the Merkel Helix is renowned to be the fastest straight pull on the market. This is a beautiful rifle. But what's different about this, it's a pure linear straight pull, but the bolt handle only moves half the distance of the bolt head. Very clever bit of engineering.
when you're recycling the round, it is so fast. Look, look at my hand. Bolt handle itself is only traveling half the distance of the bolt head. So once again, different technology, different mechanisms, different systems, all about trying to take that second or third shot faster and faster and faster. It's fascinating. It's really interesting actually, because we all have different preferences when we're buying anything, whether it's a car or a rifle. Now, I think some people may like the blazer. It's just so slick. It comes back in your face a wee bit compared to the other rifles. The, the, the morale, you know, you just, just let it go. And I think that is a, a real selling point. But the, the Merkel Helix is so unique. It's just the way that, that I just move my hand. It just, and that really must make a huge difference. Imagine you've got a ride in a wood. It's 20 meters wide and you've got three or four shots to take it at, this, at the animal. I imagine that will make a wee bit of difference to really, really get those four shots off. The Browning Morale, the cheapest on test today, around about £2,000, very, very fast, and it has a 10-shot magazine available as an optional extra, very, very useful. Fluted barrel and a very, very capable rifle, not quite as accurate as the other two, about one and a half inches at 100 metres maybe. I'm sure some better ammo will improve on that. Moving on to the Merkel Helix. Very clever bit of kit. They start about two and a half thousand pounds. This is about three and a half. She's got grade two walnut. Very, very nice bit of walnut. Bit too good for me. But uh, a lovely action. We talked about the two to one transmission. That moves two inches, that moves four inches. Very, very clever actually. So the cycling the rounds is a lot, lot faster. Very well engineered bit of kit. It's take down very, very quickly. Um, so it's a very clever rifle. A uh, larger magazine also available, uh, which is quite useful if you're shooting lots of uh, running ball targets. Last but not least is the Blazer R8. It's my own little go-to rifle. It's modular, take down, you can do anything with this. Uh, one problem with it, as far as some people are concerned, you can hold four in the magazine and one up the spout, that's it. So therefore if you want to change magazines quickly, you either got to load or buy another one of those and they're not cheap. Once again, the action itself is radial, it locks out. So very different to the other two, but a very, very, very compact rifle. This one's got a short barrel to it. I've actually shortened it by another three inches, so I stick my moderator on, and it's just a very, very pointable rifle. The Blazer R8 starts around two and a half thousand pounds with professional success around about the £3,000, but a very, very nice rifle. The nice thing about these other rifles is you can shoot them with open sights. I just love shooting rifles with open sights. Just pop the uh, lid off and look at this. What a rifle. That is so light and compact. I just love just shooting things with open sights anyways. And that's your three straight pull rifles. Thank you, Tim, from a small rifle range to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. The Purdy Awards took place recently. London gunmaker James Purdy gives an award to the shoot that has done, in the opinion of its judges, most for conservation in the last year. Here is a film about 2016 winner David Sanford and the Port Lochan shoot in County Down, Northern Ireland. Staying on Pheasants, viewer Giles Molem recommends Shot Away Films channel on YouTube, including this film about the village shoot on the edge, claims the filmmaker of the village of Dibley, which explains why it is set to Howard Goodall's The Lord is my shepherd. Viewer Andy Maguire contacts me via Facebook about Hunting COC Volume 1 Episode 1, which is Foxing with the Nightside Eagle Artek. It's a jolly trip out into the countryside with a ticker T3 light in 243. Waiting out for deer is a big American thing. Here is a sweet reaction from a woman who shoots her first deer. Josh Honeycutt's wife Catherine reacts with small squeaking noises and they are brought to you by camo company Realtree. Staying in the stands, this film shows shooting deer with a shotgun. Shake the raindrops from the roses and singe the whiskers off the kittens. This is not everyone's favourite thing, but undoubtedly effective. It is the opening day of the deer gun season in Ohio and the shooter is using a Remington 1187-12 gauge. In Scotland, Edinburgh, falconry and fishing records a fast smash on a rabbit with a Harris Hawk. The rabbit 
can hear the bells on the hawk but is too slow to break into a run. Hunting Channel records a driven hunt in Gunsbach deep in Germany's Black Forest. You see no pigs shot but you get a strong sense of life as a driven wild boar beater. Usually a fishing channel, this is the hog vlog from Texas. Late Fork Guy is hunting feral pigs with the three must-have adjectives currently in US hog hunting circles, thermal, suppressor and tactical. That's it for this week. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Also fresh on the web this month is the December episode of Club Digweed. In this month's Club Digweed, George has a Christmas double bill of Target tuition, with targets chosen by club members. He starts with the rabbit and explains a few techniques to try and reduce those frustrating mistakes. Every time it bounces the bottom front corner of that clay where it touches the ground, that's the only focus point I've got. Oh. Plus he tackles a target being thrown from below. He also responds to some other questions posed by members. It's all in this month's Club Digweed. George would also like to let people know that there have been a few technical issues on his website, meaning emails have not been received. That has now been resolved. So for more information about membership and downloading the show, go to georgedigweed.com. Where did they get that low-budget voiceover artist? Anyway, we're back next week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, or pop your email into our register page, and we'll contact you about our show. Field Sports Britain is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday, and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. Goodbye.